Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people out today. I wanted to say hi to community friends, to staff, to faculty, to, and I don't think we have any students at the moment. Students, wonderful, welcome. Um, it's really nice to see you out today. Uh, my name is Madian Andrade. I'm a professor here in biology, and I'm also the Vice Dean uh, Faculty Affairs and Equity at UTSC. And I'm bringing you greetings from Professor Bill Goff, who unfortunately is at a meeting downtown that he couldn't avoid today. He uh, finds this seminar series is very close to his heart because he is hoping that it's a way to have us increase our interactions with the local community in particular. Uh, we would like to, in this seminar series to introduce to you some of our faculty who are dealing with uh, issues that are important to Canada and to global policy and to engage in conversations with you about how you react to uh, the material that they're going to be presenting and your perspective on the global issues around policy as well. So we're looking forward to this as a beginning of kind of a dialogue, especially over the next few weeks. We hope to see some of you coming more than once to these events. Um, and really a collaborative interaction with our community is what we're hoping for. Uh, now, the goal of the series really is to encourage this interaction. It took a lot of effort to put it together, so I want to thank some of the people in the room who were involved in doing that. I also want to thank the professors, starting with Professor Andrea Caris, who's going to be our first speaker, who uh, uh, have given their time for this event. Uh, at its best, we hope this series will draw on the strengths of our faculty and the strengths of our local community so that we can have these conversations in a positive way. Now today's speaker, the first in our series, uh, Professor Andrea Caris, as I said, is an assistant professor of health studies here at UTSC. She holds cross appointments in the Faculty of Medicine's Department of Psychiatry and graduate faculty appointments in the Department of English, as well as a collaborative graduate program in women's health at Women's College Research Institute. So you can already tell from her different roles that she has a very interdisciplinary research approach. She has many years of experience as a medical researcher in clinical epidemiology and geriatrics, and her current research interests represent a rich interdisciplinary fusion of these fields with health studies and uh, humanities and arts. She's the founding director and principal investigator of SCOPE, the Health Humanities Learning Lab, which is an arts and humanities based research and education initiative here at UTSC. Now the health humanities approach, I've learned a lot about this since um, Andrea has been hired, is one that has been really uh, gaining momentum in the United States and in Europe for the past 30 years, but one which is fairly new to Canada. And it's one that recognizes that combining biomedical education with education around the experience of health and wellness and illness through the arts and through the humanities can bring new skills to our healthcare um, practitioners. So for example, empathy for the patients they're treating, for example, the ability to read narratives, which are so critical in diagnostics, uh, more clearly. So the marrying of humanities and arts and understanding this experience, along with biomedical um, training, can be very important. And this is some of the work that Andrea has been promoting here uh, and has created the very first undergraduate program in health humanities here at UTSC. So we're thrilled to be hosting that um, initiative. So Professor Carice's scholarship and teaching includes then humanistic approaches to health studies, also English literature, geriatric, geriatrics and age studies, and narrative training for health professionals along the lines of what I just described. The hallmark of her work really is this merging of different fields to increase the strength of all of them. She's a 2014 recipient of the John Charles Pollyani Prize for Literature, the 2008 recipient of the Canadian Institute of Health Research's Age Plus Prize, the Laura Metzger Prize from the International Conference on Romanticism. And here at UTSC, she was named the 2016 Professor of the Year by the undergraduate journal, The Underground, an award that honors faculty members for outstanding excellence in teaching and dedication to imparting knowledge. So we really are quite thrilled to have her here today, and her talk is entitled Arts and the Future of Health, From Research to Activism. We'll hear from her first, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm still getting used to the feeling of being introduced. It's like, wow, the person sounds kind of interesting. It's like, oh, that's me. Oh, OK. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, the power of the text, I guess that's one example. Um, thank you, Professor Andrade, for that introduction and uh, to you for taking the time to come today. I hope that um, you've given such a, such a wonderful introduction to an overview of the talk. Um, and I hope that uh, by meeting some of you just prior to the talk, I think we'll have a lot to talk about in terms of health professional education, teaching in the arts. And it sounds like you're uh, just the audience I, uh, I could have hoped for for this talk. 
I'm very grateful to the Dean's Office for this invitation. Uh, so thanks uh, to you and to uh, uh, Professor Goff for that. And what I'd like to do today in my talk is to introduce you to this field uh, that is increasingly being known as health humanities, um, with a specific interest in how this field is and is not growing um, in the Canadian context in particular. Um, so uh, like any good lecture, classroom or otherwise, I'll begin with an, an overview and a kind of a roadmap of where we're headed, starting with some definitions. What is this field? What is health? What is humanities? Give you a sense of really the scope of this field and then drill down into a specific example of research that I've been involved with um, in the hospital setting, particularly working with uh, nurses and um, the uh, impact of expressive writing training with uh, pediatric rehab nurses. I'll then go into the second part of the talk where I talk about this interesting position that we're at in this country with regard to arts-based approaches to health research and policy interventions. In some ways, we're looking at an open road, uh, but in other ways, we're facing rather considerable roadblocks. So I'd like to uh, take you through what I've seen, again, through another aspect of my research, um, what are some of the considerable systemic roadblocks that exist for um, furthering the insights of this field in the Canadian context in particular. And then finally, I, you know, I'm a, I, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller, right? So we have to end up kind of on, a, on an up note. Um, I, I want to go into uh, the more specific example of work here at UTSC where um, I've done my best to uh, navigate some of these roadblocks and um, look at the ways in which post-secondary education in health humanities really challenges us to uh, think about breaking down the boundaries that traditionally exist between research and education and what I am daring to call activism uh, around these very topics. So I hope that uh, I will stimulate you uh, over the course of, course of the next uh, 50 minutes or so. And as uh, Professor Andrade says, uh, we'll open it up for uh, Q&A at that point. So before we get started, as I, as I know this uh, phrase, health humanities, is probably new to, to many of you. So um, let's start with a few definitions. And as you probably already know, health is a big bucket. It is comprised of many sub-disciplines, many, many more than I would be able to uh, diagram here. Um, but uh, we might think of medicine, community health, social, political, economic factors that both contribute to and form aspects of uh, the, the study of health uh, in, the, in the most general sense. We can see, just based on the uh, subdivisions sub, uh, that I've provided here, a generally scientific thrust um, to the study of health. But I want to draw your attention to a really important definition, and that's the definition of health provided to us by the World Health Organization. As you can see here, I want you to pay attention to the language because the WHO defines health um, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. So it's something a little more than, are you sick or are you well? It's, it's not just the absence of, of sickness. But the language, and again, you can tell I'm, my, my background in, in English literature is, is showing here. But let's look especially at the language of this next part of the definition that describes health as a positive concept, emphasizing social and personal resources. And that, to me, um, doesn't really speak very strongly to the kind of work that we might expect to see coming out of a biomedical or even a public health, um, uh, public health kind of discipline, right? The uh, reference to social and personal resources is in fact inviting the kind of knowledge making processes that we should uh, associate with the critical social sciences and the humanities. So even in this very established definition of health, there is an invitation to think not just in an interdisciplinary sense, but with reference to what the arts and humanities can do right there in that definition. So I'll ask you to remember that as we, uh, as we carry on. So turning to our next key word, humanities. And when I say humanities, I, I really do mean arts and humanities, but I might just try to compress my, uh, my, my, my speaking as much as I can, since you'll see that I can go on and on and on. Um, so turning to this other keyword, like health, uh, the arts and humanities are composed of many uh, sub-disciplines um, ranging from the more critical side 
of arts and humanities, for example, uh, the critical practices of history, of law, bioethics, philosophy, these sorts of critical disciplines, as well as the more creative disciplines such as literature, visual arts, dance, drama, the, the more kind of creative, artistic, expressive sides of things. What unites those critical and creative practices that make up arts and humanities is their interest, their shared interest on the processing and the documentation of human experience. And not just the processing and documentation of human experience, but the presentation of that often through creative content, through creative artistic or works of intellectual, um, intellectual expression. And that's what more or less distinguishes the arts and humanities from the more scientific disciplines. Of course, there are always opportunities where that's not the case. But if we're just talking about a kind of a rough hewn definition, that's how we can distinguish um, uh, the arts and humanities from mostly uh, the, the natural and, and some of the social sciences. In the arts and humanities, we get to speculate. We get to make things. We get to play with evidence. That's not quite the case in, uh, in the biology lab. But that is nevertheless the way we make knowledge through the arts and humanities. And so things like critical inquiry, aesthetics, beauty, these are, these are topics of interest, topics of concern when we decide to root ourselves in the arts and humanities. OK, so those are our two, our two key words. When we talk health, we talk humanities. So what happens then if we decide to take health and illness as an object of study and instead of approaching it through the more traditional disciplinary standpoints of um, uh, the physical or the natural sciences, biological sciences, what happens when we decide to take an arts and humanities approach? What do they bring to the table? And in short, what the arts and humanities give us by focusing us in a humanistic um, sort of home base of knowledge is a very good sense of the individual experience of health and illness. And again, I've, I've laid out on this slide a sense for you. I want to make it very clear at this point that this is not about saying, oh, the humanity is so much better than well, public health or biomedicine or anthropology. Get rid of all that stuff. Of course not. I mean, if we were to have, I mean, I've put health, illness, and disability in the middle here, but you could imagine any particular illness or condition. Let's put, for example, imagine HIV AIDS in the middle of this circle here. We're not going to know much more about HIV AIDS if we don't have a very good understanding of what a lentivirus does, how it works, under what conditions it's transmitted. Nor will we understand the full picture of HIV AIDS if we don't have a sense of the population patterns, what uh, elements of public health knowledge allow us to see how HIV AIDS is transmitted throughout a community or in terms of um, its epidemiological occurrence and so on. But likewise, even with those two pieces together, in the case of HIV AIDS, we still won't have a full picture if we don't pay attention to anthropological concerns, things like stigma, the ways in which the label of a disease can carry a very heavy burden that is not physiological and yet impacts the lives and the cultures of people who have that illness. Okay? And likewise, this is where the arts and humanities fits into the picture. What the arts and humanities are really good at doing is giving us knowledge of that texture of the individual experience. The texture of the individual experience that may be very different within a singular culture or within a country, a larger population pattern. If we don't attend to the arts and humanities, what goes missing in our discussions of health and illness is that individual experience. What is a person to person to person experience? which of course is a series of experiences that are probably as diverse as the number of persons we, and creative expressions of that that we solicit. So texture, individualization, that's what we get a really good sense of by turning to the arts and humanities. So one of the ways, the data set, if you will, of the arts and humanities often is something like stories creative artworks. And again, given my background in English literature, I'm especially interested in the way that our writing, both of visual as well as textual stories, can help us find out, seek out, feel out that texture of the individual experience of health and illness. So stories, in a sense, become a data point 
And that's what we in the health humanities are particularly interested in sniffing out, working with, and uh, convey, understanding the, the importance of those individual forms of creative expression. So now that I've given you a sense of really what we're working with, why it is we might turn to the arts to do this kind of work, I'd like to give you just again a, a, a kind of a romp through the ways that health humanities um, really uh, exist or can be found in our, in our society. Maybe these are examples that you've already encountered um, without having the language of health humanities to help define it for you. Um, but I, I'm sure that you're going to see at least a couple of things that you're already familiar with. And I'll just refer here to a really wonderful infographic by the Arts Health Network of Canada where I've drawn um, uh, a lot of this kind of overview information. And they are just an incredible resource uh, in this country for sure. So the first example, maybe the most straightforward example of health humanities as an, in the applied sense, is the use of art in hospitals. And our own Baycrest Hospital is an excellent example of this, the art cart program that allows patients or residents in the hospital to select pieces of art from the collections in the hospital and actually decorate their own rooms. And that sounds, on the one hand, like a very nice thing, and it, it certainly is. But what's important to know is that recent studies have also described the healing uh, properties of aesthetically interesting or aesthetically stimulating um, hospital spaces. And on the flip side of that, the uh, detrimental effect of aesthetically bare or kind of bare concrete, um, unadorned uh, hospital settings. This has actually been found to have a negative effect on patient recovery time. So there's something actually empirical to be found about uh, decorating your room. So go out and buy some art today. You've got my permission. Uh, the next thing, uh, again, art therapy is an example of how we might think of uh, the application of health humanities. Many, many examples, the Toronto Art Therapy Institute uh, downtown. Also, a Sketch, I'll uh, draw your attention to, given uh, that uh, folks from Sketch have come out to my Introduction to Health Humanities class. This is a community arts initiative that works um, to develop skills with street-involved and homeless youth. Uh, in Toronto, and uh, their, their, their mandate is, is wide and large, but some of the work that they do involves uh, creating paper and sculpture and some really incredible um, arts-based uh, skills development for uh, young people that, uh, that may be street involved. Health communication is another way in which we might think of the application or the utility of the arts in the service of health. We have uh, some of my favorite uh, historical relics are um, early 20th century uh, public health posters about venereal disease. Um, that's just one of many. The uh, NIH uh, has an incredible collection of those online. Also, as I said, infographics, that's an increasingly popular way of communicating health data, so the use of art and visual logics to do that. And I'll also flag for you uh, the University of Toronto's Mississauga campus, their graduate program in biomedical communications, which is actually a graduate training program for students that um, are interested in becoming visualizers of scientific information. Every time you've got a textbook that has a picture of a cell or a cellular process or something of that nature, somebody's got to draw that, somebody's got to design that. And in Canada, that is one of the few programs where you can go and actually professionalize um, in that very area. So a very exciting program. And then uh, the last example I'll mention today uh, in terms of these applied examples of health humanities is in the context of health education. This is something I'll be coming back to. This is an element of my own research. But I'll show you the way just here, um, speaking of HIV a little earlier, this is an HIV education dance troupe in Tanzania that goes around the country and through dance uh, communicates um, both ways of uh, ensuring that people are having safe sex, ways to uh, attempt to diminish HIV, uh, HIV rates, and so on. And again, that is through dance. And it's important to think about the application of various kinds of the arts for, uh, in response to the demands or the, the qualities, uh, the characteristics of certain communities in a place where literacy rates may be lower, it's really important that we are not just using uh, written forms of artistic communication, right? Dance, in this case, is an especially, it's exciting. I mean, look, look how acrobatic this is. I mean, 
uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I can hardly even look at it, right? I mean, this is a very visual, very physical, um, very attractive way of bringing a crowd to learn about health. And we do that through this particular example of the art dance in this case. So those are the, some applied uh, examples of health humanities. But we can also, as I said earlier, think of health humanities as a kind of critical perspective or critical orientation towards health and illness as objects of study. And something that I think is really important to uh, remind certainly my students, but also, also many of us, uh, lay and uh, uh, research oriented alike, is that health is itself an object of study. Health has a history. Health has not always been a cleanly defined, objective uh, you know, set of um, you know, empirically gathered uh, you know, scientific knowledge and data points, right? It's, it has a history. It, uh, health is profoundly imbricated with the isms, isms like sexism, isms like racism, colonialism, ableism. And the way in which, say, a, 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 a clearer sense of medical history allows us to highlight the ideological bases of health and illness can expose to us why social determinants of health are what they are in our own time uh, and, and many other perspectives as well. Highlighting also, um, as Professor Andrade was suggesting, narratives of patienthood, highlighting, drawing forth the ill person's voice especially in the clinical encounter. Um, that's a very different way of understanding what a patient has to say, quite a bit different than just taking a medical history. And we'll get to that in just a moment. I hope this is sort of piquing your, piquing your interests. So one of the ways, certainly, that we can think about um, medicine's own, medi medicine and health's own complex and at times troubling history is by looking at the history specifically of medical illustration. Because we, we might start, or imagine starting, with the images of Leonardo, Di uh, I was about to say Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. I'd like to see those. <laughs> very interesting, very, very important work. <laughs> but DiCaprio is preceded by Da Vinci. And um, so we might start with, with these uh, images uh, four, 500 years old now. And, and look at the way, say, um, medical illustration has, well, perhaps we might use the word evolved, but it certainly changed in the early 21st century. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with the Body Worlds exhibit. Any, any has anyone seen the Body Worlds exhibit? Yeah, yeah. So moving from the drawings, very anatomically correct drawings of the bodily interior, to the plastination of actual bodies, bodies that may or may not have consented to being plasticized and put on a very expensive traveling exhibit uh, for the profit of, well, Maybe I'll let you do a little research of your own. But here we have an anatomical exhibition that is steeped with um, a very complex, very deep political history. And uh, in our own time, we can see these bodies as um, yeah, perhaps being the subject of a very troubling uh, medicine, very troubling history of, of taking up bodies that it perhaps doesn't have permission to use for the purposes of education. So I, again, I hope I've tantalized you a little bit with that. Um, we might also just think more generally of embodiment, that is the condition of having a body as the subject of art. And if you know Frida Kahlo, uh, this is a uh, pendant actually that I have, I'm not wearing it today, maybe I should have, um, that is a structurally accurate um, HIV virus. The use of aspects of health and medicine to inspire artworks uh, or embroideries. Uh, Marianne Satrapi, uh, the author of Persepolis, which might be uh, familiar to some of you as a graphic novel and animated film on uh, women's health in Iran and uh, specifically um, the use of uh, cosmetic vaginoplasty and its inter intersection with larger questions of, of women's health. Uh, embodiment has, has long been the interest of art. And thinking about art therapy in the individual sense a little earlier, we might look to the efforts being made to bring um, the arts to bear on the healing of national wounds, um, of, of national conflicts. Uh, certainly, this is something that was uh, a direct strategy in the wake of the um, uh, uh, post-apartheid South Africa. But in the Canadian context, uh, this is certainly uh, a major emphasis of the Truth and, Reconcilia Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's um, efforts to, uh, to heal 
although that is, wor uh, that is a word I would like to flag for you as, as perhaps a problematic or a troubling one. Who's healing? is uh, being insured here. But call to action number 83 actually had makes specific references to greater support of the arts and support for Indigenous artists as one aspect of uh, reconciliation with Canada's own uh, settler and colonial history. So that's one way we might imagine um, health humanities being enacted at the national level. So I hope, again, with this, with this romp, I, uh, w w that we have romped together and that I've uh, just given you a sense of uh, the sort of more applied all the way over to the more critical engagements of health humanities, each of which are engaging with the creative expression of conditions of health and illness. And I think that one way we might um, continue to think about the value of health humanities is the way that, in a sense, it is a, a new, new phrase or a new name for an old thing. Uh, it was Hippocrates uh, that millennia ago told us that art is long and life is short in the text that we now call the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, so there's a very long-standing relationship between the uh, arts and health. This is also a diverse field of study with a growing number of employment opportunities. Health Humanities also speaks to a sense of some dissatisfaction with the dominant models of healthcare. Uh, those of you that have visited a hospital recently may or may not have uh, enjoyed your experience thoroughly. So a sense of, well, maybe we could talk a little bit more about bedside manner. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about empathy, what compassion entails. Health Humanities has an opportunity to intervene in that sense. And then, and this is allowing me to pivot into the next part of my talk, the sense that the humanities are actually pretty good at developing qualities or skills that are directly relevant to the health professions. For example, things like empathy, things like observation skills or close noticing, the ability to draw forward a patient's story, um, and just the more general task of being competent in thick and rich critical thinking. These are things that are all um, uh, possible for health professionals to bring to bear on their clinical practice and something that the humanities have long been really good at developing. So this is where, with this in mind, I'd like to just drill down into some of my own research uh, in, these very, uh, in these very settings and with this, uh, these very topics in mind. Um, and talk specifically about the use of expressive writing in the health setting, particularly the, uh, the hospital setting. As you might know, if there are any journalers um, in the audience, uh, writing has long been understood to possess a kind of a therapeutic, uh, restful, healing kind of property. And the specific example of um, expressive writing being brought to bear on uh, persons, for example, with severe cognitive or physical impairments, um, this has actually been uh, determined to actually have some therapeutic uh, benefits as well. So for instance, some of the work I've done with the past has involved working with older persons that do have uh, certain stages of dementia and actually drawing forward their uh, fascinating narratives and uh, rather poetic engagements with the world around them. And the, this, this idea of writing having a therapeutic effect in the clinical setting has actually been backed up by evidence. Um, uh, various outcomes such as um, quality of life, social engagement, <coughs> sense of selfhood, these have been um, some of the outcomes of doing expressive writing with persons who may have various levels or various um, uh, levels of, uh, of, of illness or identify with, with various kinds of illnesses. So that's on the patient side of things, but speaking now about expressive writing for health professionals, this isn't just something that is of benefit to people that identify themselves as being sick or being ill, that in fact doing this kind of work with health professionals seems to be um, in similar ways therapeutic or to have a, a kind of a positive benefit. What you're looking at now is a book, uh, Narrative Medicine, uh, written by Rita Sharon, who is herself an internist. She's a physician um, with a PhD in English literature. She's based at Columbia University in New York. And her uh, description of what she calls narrative medicine, or more generally, uh, I'll, you'll hear me referring to it today as narrative training, is, uh, um, emphasizes the importance of hearing patients in terms of the telling of their story. So on the one hand, it's important for clinicians to understand that when patients are speaking to them in the clinical encounter, that what they are doing is telling the health professional a story of their illness. And as a result, 
clinicians and health professionals must be tasked with listening to stories and understanding these expressions of illness in terms of, of story. So teaching uh, elements of story that are relevant to the clinical encounter. And what happens um, with this uh, process, and again, this is um, not just anecdotal, this is backed up by a number of studies that uh, are actually looking for specific outcomes of this approach to clinical education. Uh, we see a number of improvements, both in terms of patient care, patient care is improved, but also in terms of the well-being of those care providers and clinicians themselves, and that's a very interesting point. On the one hand, uh, what's been determined is that this kind of expressive writing, listening and expressive writing, um, is capable of building empathy in, ho in the hospital-based uh, care setting for those kinds of professionals, and that as a result of engaging in this kind of narrative listening and expressive writing, clinicians can experience lower rates of compassion fatigue, of burnout, uh, absenteeism and these kinds of workplace um, uh, illnesses and uh, very important, uh, very troubling aspects of, um, of, of the very stressful environment uh, that is often involved with healthcare. So diminishing those very things that make healthcare such a challenging profession. So one thing I want to do just before I go on to my own research is to say, okay, so it's probably not a surprise to any of us here that healthcare is, of course, a challenging profession. But I want to show you a really an interesting example of something that I saw in The Atlantic just last week, just published in, the, in March 24th. And what this is, is an article about medical students in Cleveland who were uh, under the banner of uh, an expressive writing exercise, such as the one I've just outlined for you, asked to draw comics. These are not artists, but they were just invited to draw comics about their experiences as medical students. And what these comics very quickly revealed, what they shone a light on, was the profoundly dysfunctional um, ethics or uh, principles of much of their own medical education. And as you can see here, this sort of awry, uh, sort of crazed um, uh, uh, chief is dealing with these medical students uh, through verbal abuse, one is standing in a puddle of pee. I'm not sure if that is like literally or figuratively intended, but what a comic like this does, and I really do encourage you to read the article, is demonstrate um, in, in, in very, very clear black and white terms the way in which medical education is, ex is itself propelled and engineered upon profound differences in power, profound, um, uh, in, in many cases, not just dysfunction, but outright abusive behaviors. Of course, this is not the case in all medical, uh, you know, in all medical schools. I don't want to suggest that for a moment. And yet, part of medical culture makes this not such a strange thing to encounter, and in fact, a rather common thing to encounter. And I'd like to suggest, and certainly the authors of this article suggest, that beginning in medical education, we see the kind of uh, diminishment of empathy, the diminishment of uh, the possibility of being vulnerable, the possibility of not knowing something, of learning. That is established very strongly at the medical education level. So is it any surprise when the diminishments, these diminishments, these power dynamics come up again, sprout again in the context of the clinical encounter? So there's something systemic, there's a big problem with medical education as it's currently and conventionally understood. And these comics give, uh, give, uh, give light to that unfortunate, but of course, I think very necessary um, opportunity for change. So this is where as promised, um, my own research uh, comes to bear. So I've been talking a lot about medicine, I'm talking a lot about medical students, but one of the uh, projects that I've been involved in recently is the application of a narrative training initiative with a uh, group of healthcare professionals that are rarely uh, rarely involved in this kind of work, and that is specifically um, uh, nurses and even more specifically pediatric rehabilitation nurses. So I want to give you a sense of the research that we did with, um, with these nurses. And as you may know, um, the pediatric rehab uh, context is uh, exceptionally complex. In any kind of pediatric care, of course, you have a, a child who is the patient, but inevitably you are also dealing with 
uh, a family, parents, an extended, uh, an extended idea of who the patient is. So that's, that's one initial aspect of its complexity. And then in the rehabilitation co uh, a context, you're often dealing with very chronic, often very painful, uh, sometimes incurable illnesses or conditions. And so this is a very high uh, pressure, uh, high stress environment especially for the nurses who are tasked with the immediate moment-to-moment, -moment, day day-to-day care, um, often without the kind of cachet of the institution that is afforded to medical professionals. So what we wanted to do was see if a short six-week narrative training initiative had any impact on these pediatric rehab nurses, particularly on, in terms of whether this narrative training did anything in terms of soliciting uh, improvements in terms of their empathy. And so what we did, I'll walk you through it very, uh, very quickly now, we created a, uh, a qualitative study, uh, just a small group of eight such nurses every week attended uh, a 90 minute session, a narrative training session. And so um, what those narrative training sessions involved was uh, for the first five or ten minutes or so, the nurses would be asked to read a short piece of literature. And, and one of the spots that I found was a, a very good example or a very good resource for this kind of work was in a book like this, Intensive Care, More Poetry and Prose by Nurses. And uh, I haven't, I should have thought to flag some of the poems that we use, but you'll take a look and see that this is poetry and prose written by nurses. It is inspired by the issues that nurses face. And so we chose poems, often sh short pieces of literature, that in some ways we thought would probably speak to some aspect of the experience that was typical to our pediatric rehab nurses doing the intervention. So we would either do a piece of literature or we would do a short comic, such as the one that uh, you see here. Um, and one of our favorite uh, authors is uh, known as Comic Nurse, uh, available online, uh, that again, just uses the comic form to bring uh, issues of, of nursing, nursing life to life, I suppose you could say. So following the reading of our chosen, uh, our chosen text for that day, either visual or textual, um, we would then discuss that piece of work, what, was, what, was, what struck them about uh, this piece of work, what it made them think about, and so on. And after about 20 or 30 minutes of that discussion, we would then stop the discussion, pause the discussion, I suppose, and offer them a quick read, writing or a drawing prompt. And here are just an exa a few examples of some of those prompts. Write about a time that you or a family member received care in hospital. So here's an example of kind of flipping the way our healthcare providers typically think about care. They deliver care, and all of a sudden, through this prompt, we were asking them to inhabit the position of someone themselves who had received care, to just sort of say, okay, what happens when you stop being the caregiver and you start being the care receiver? How does that affect your understanding of the clinical encounter? Another one, write about a time when a patient or a parent took their grief or anger out on you. And so we were able to solicit some rather rather astonishing, rather moving stories of these nurses who, uh, for reasons, those of us that are parents, probably understand very well why you might get very upset in the context of a clinical counter where your child is in pain, relentless pain, you don't, you're not sure what's going on, a diagnosis is not forthcoming, and sometimes you behave badly. These are the nurses, they have incredible stories about being the recipient of that very profound, very intense emotion. Some of them wrote about that. What our results are, and I am very happy to go into the details of our study. There's a lot of methods I'm kind of putting aside <laughs> for the purpose. Anybody who wants to get down in the weeds, just let me know. We'll do it at the Q&A. But um, some of the results that I want to share with you was our discovery of what we, what we were calling a kind of triple effect of empathy. So doing this kind of narrative training once a week for six weeks, what we saw were changes in empathy realized on three levels. The first an improvement of empathy for patients and their families. The second, and this again was a surprise for us, not just patients and their families, but for the nursing, their colleagues as nurses themselves. So instead of being really pissed that someone forgot to do this or dropped it or left their shift early, that they were able to, the participants were able to understand the kind of thicker backstory of why someone might have either dropped the ball or appear to have dropped the ball, but in fact, you know, was, was called away or something, giving a sense of that sense of empathy for your colleagues. And then third of all, this final layer, was a sense of empathy for what we call empathy for the self. 
this idea that uh, especially, and this was sort of alluded to in that earlier comic with the, by the medical student, the idea that a myth of perfection is so entrenched in healthcare that understanding that care does not, will not, cannot um, be perfectly realized every time was a way of allowing um, our nurses to have a, have, have a little more peace, you might say, with regard to um, their own expectations of failure and the inevitability of coming up short in the clinical context. And that was something that was valuable to them. One theme that we found in the post-interviews uh, post that I thought was particularly remarkable was a theme that we called the renewal of professional purpose. Renewal of professional purpose that seemed to come out of doing this narrative training work. And this is where our nurses sort of realized that their position in the hospital setting was a really important one. I think we forget how, what we do here. And I think talking about it, listening to other staff's experiences, it makes you realize how important your role is. And to have a realization like that especially by um, a group of healthcare providers that are generally women, that are generally not given the same kind of institutional and credentialed cachet as their medical counterparts. To have a way of renewing a sense of professional purpose was for us a rather extraordinary outcome of, uh, of this narrative training, uh, in, uh, narrative training intervention, which was, as I said, quite a modest one, just once a week over six weeks. So as I said, this triple benefit was um, quite remarkable to us and we were really excited by it because what it allows us to do is to extend the literature that currently exists on narrative training and show the particular ways in which it works for a group that's not usually attended to in this kind of work, looking specifically at nurses and then more specifically still in the pediatric rehab context. So some exciting uh, uh, new data uh, developed there. So, good news, right? What's stopping us? What's stopping us? Let's, let's just have narrative training, let it, let's do it everywhere. Let's do, and in a sense, that is, that is very much kind of how I feel about things. Art is low risk, art is low cost. You know, I mean, the worst that can happen is you spill paint on yourself, right? This is, this is a, a good intervention. And yet what I want to share with you now is some of the challenges that face this field, specifically in the Canadian context. So on the one hand, there's no doubt that we are in a moment of real excitement in health humanities. We have journals, we have scholarly conferences, there are research networks, um, uh, humanities curriculum is an accredited part of medical school curricula across North America. I mean, this is all very, very good news. And yet, um, one of the questions I've had, and certainly um, a number of my colleagues across North America are having is, okay, well, that's great news for medicine, great news for medical school. But that's a pretty walled garden, pretty tall walled garden. Are there other ways, are there other folks that can benefit from the insights of health humanities outside of the medical school context? And so this is where this question of, all right, well, what happens when we create or create the conditions for um, undergraduate training in medical humanities or health humanities? What, what happens there? So I want to I want to give you this sort of very interesting case. Okay, so since about the 1970s, uh, we've seen the growth of health humanities programs. But really, in the last 20 years or so, that is where we've seen seen the growth of these programs outside of medical schools. So today, you know, what is it? April 3rd. Uh, there is approximately 65 undergraduate, that is outside of medical schools, undergraduate programs in the United States. So this is obviously, it's growing, but it's happening, okay. Compare that with Canada where there is, as of February 28th, there's one. Okay, I mean that is a rather considerable difference between our neighbor to the south and our own. And in some ways this is perhaps a predictable kind of difference. We can think about things like demographic imperative. There are a lot more undergraduate you know, students in colleges and universities in the states. There's more demand for programs. We might also think about perhaps the, as a result, another kind of demographic imperative. Maybe there's just more qualified instructors in the United States as a result of population, okay? Greater institutional tolerance, perhaps, for uh, interdisciplinary curricula. Yeah, these are all possible factors. 
But I want to draw your attention to something that another aspect of my research has discovered. And um, the work that I'm about to show you, actually, this is like a super hot take. This is about to be published any moment now in the Journal of Medical Humanity. So you, you, uh, you all get a sneak peek of this. One of the things that's weird, at least to my mind, to my mind was weird, was that health humanities is really thriving in two places. It's thriving, as I was mentioning, in the United States. But it's also thriving in the UK. So we have this geographical and kind of political setting of the United States, private health care, but also we have the very public health care setting of the UK. And these are the two places where we can really see undergraduate health humanities really blossoming. So these seem like very, very different settings to have this kind of innovation in health education. So as I went through in my research, what seems to be the case, what the difference maker is, we might say, between the US and the UK and the Canadian context, where this is just, I mean, just barely beginning to pick up speed, what the US and the UK do have in common are federal research funds and funding bodies that acknowledge and invite multidisciplinary health research projects. And in the US, this takes the form of the NEH. In the UK, the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, as well as private trusts that are quite large, quite open, such as Welcome and the Lever Home. Now, interesting, of course, I mean, terrifying, actually, to see the NEH up here. Um, this was obviously a research that I completed before um, we received the news of Trump's plans to close the NEH or to deny funding to it. This is now not, this is not something I want to be right about anymore. Um, I do not want to see if the uh, lack of funding to the NEH in future years actually puts a halt on health humanities funding. But if it does, it'll certainly give, um, unfortunately, a little bit of evidence that the availability of multi-sectoral multidisciplinary, the availability of multidisciplinary health funds has something to do with the encouragement of health humanities outside of the medical school environment. So what we have here is basically what I just said. What seems to be happening is a correlation between the availability of this kind of multidisciplinary health research and the growth of post-secondary health humanities training. The Canadian situation is quite different, and I promise I won't go through all of the, uh, the gritty details, but basically there are three, there's what's called the Tri-Council um, funding bodies in Canada, the CIHR for health research, NSERC for natural sciences and engineering, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Those are the major funding bodies that researchers, say, at this university and elsewhere would be applying to further their work. Something happened in 2009, however, and that's where SHRC, the body of, of uh, the funding body responsible for funding humanities-based research, changed its eligibility guidelines to specifically exclude, quote, humanities perspectives on health, including health ethics. So if you were working in those areas, you could not apply, you cannot apply to SHRC for this kind of work. Now SHRC was very quick to say, and still is on its website, you can go and read it now, that don't worry, essentially, well they didn't say that, but they should have, don't worry, um, the CIHR, the health research funding body, has policies and procedures in place to adjudicate the full range of social science and humanities research proposals related to health research. So basically, instead of applying to, C, uh, to SHRC, apply to CIHR, they, they'll take care of you, they take care of you. But this is where the problem exists, right? The, the gap, huge gap, between the advertised mandate of CIHR and the reality of its selection committees. Less than 5% of its selection committees have social science or humanities backgrounds. In other words, and this is, uh, I'm taking a, a piece from the work of uh, Mathieu Albert and Elise Paradis, social scientists and humanists work on health is not being evaluated by peers, but rather by scientists whose epistemic habitus their disciplinary training, in other words, may clash with theirs. So even though our work is being shuttled over to CIHR, there's no peer review body that's really capable of understanding what it is the arts and humanities do. In other words, that first section of the, of the talk that we uh, walked through earlier together. So this has led me to propose uh, the need to 
do something very quickly about this. If we are serious, and I sure hope we are, I am, if we're serious about enhancing the um, growth and the presence of health humanities here in Canada, we need to act. We need to make this an issue. And the first way we can do this, and I guess by we, I'm talking about not just academics, but um, folks that believe that health humanities and the kind of work that it achieves and it does, folks that think that important, which I hope uh, at least to some of you now as a result of this talk, we have to lobby against this very heavily sectorized approach to health funding. Uh, an approach that, as I laid out for you in the last couple of slides, sees health in a very specific, uh, uh, primarily by, as, a, as an issue primarily of biomedicine. On the same, uh, by the same token, however, we also need to put pressure on the humanities funding bodies, on SHRP, to say, look, health is itself an object of study that benefits from and invites arts and humanities perspectives. And we have to find out ways of doing better um, to, uh, doing a better job of articulating that very problem. The second thing we need to do, and this is where um, our colleagues in the UK have done an excellent job, we need to coordinate our efforts of policymakers and academics, and as well as policymakers in long-term care, arts and culture. We need to all get on board to make a case for the use of this work, the use and the value of this kind of interdisciplinary arts-based approach to health. And for as long as that's going to take, in the meantime, we need a stopgap. And in that, in that time, until we realize those first two points, what we have to do is somehow find ways to embolden and enhance health humanities capacity building. In other words, we have to find ways to ensure that when these two things are realized, and I sure hope and I, I, I'm confident that they will be, but we have to find ways that when these two things are realized that there is a generation of researchers, that there is a generation of health humanities practitioners that are able to take advantage of those new conditions that invite the work that they do. So with those in mind, that's where I would like to, to pivot into um, uh, the final part of my talk where um, I've been so far outlining the roadblocks that face health humanities, but I'd like to give you a sense of how I've been attempting to address that third point and uh, face this uh, challenge uh, of, of health humanities head on. And this is really where UTSC becomes this wonderful case study of uh, building how to build health humanities in Canada. And as I said, a kind of a case study, not, not just of, of health humanities program building, but also a kind of a case study as to how we might think differently about the relationships between research, academic research, um, between education, and between activism, which are not usually things that are thought of uh, in tandem together. They're usually kind of compartmentalized, certainly um, in the academic sphere. Okay. So as I mentioned a little earlier, and those of you that have, had, uh, that have access to the uh, brochures um, around the program, if you like, here they are. You're welcome to help yourself. Um, the uh, program uh, in Health Humanities was launched uh, first in fall 2014. And just at the end of February, um, UTSC's Governing Council um, approved the first minor program in Health Humanities. And th that's outlined on the brochures and on the posters that I've uh, circulated around the room. And so what my approach has been over that, uh, I guess those last almost three years now, has been to um, not only create courses, but also uh, service learning opportunities, experiential learning opportunities, research positions, um, which have actually resulted in a lot of award-winning research projects for our undergraduates in this area of health humanities. And you see just a few of them uh, on this slide. So um, another aspect of, um, again, the, the, the dovetailing with of research and education and activism around health humanities uh, through this program has been to uh, identify and really pick out the ways in which health humanities is already alive and well in our own Toronto community. And that might take the form of going to see an incredible play by uh, indigenous playwright Cliff Cardinal called Huff, which is what we saw a year or two ago. If you ever have the chance to see it, I cannot recommend it more strongly. Um, the Art as Therapy exhibit, a very controversial, really exciting exhibit uh, at the Art Gallery of Ontario a couple of years ago. But even then, it doesn't really require going downtown. Here is uh, at the Doris McCarthy Gallery, just right here at UTSC, last year, the Flesh of the World exhibit that 
um, put on display some really challenging, very interesting works, both on disability and by disability identified artists. So this is all around us, and that's been part of my um, part of my my hopes through the program is that all of a sudden seeing seeing these opportunities sort of stands is a little bit easier. It stands forward more quickly um, for uh, for my students. One of the things, um, so as I was doing this kind of work, and I'm working with undergraduates, and I'm, I'm always amazed that like professors, professors have this kind of reputation, right, of being, you know, really, really kind of heady or like obnoxious or you know, sort of self-obsessed and all the rest of it. So I was kind of like, okay, how, let's let's talk health humanities. And I'll never forget this this wonderful conversation I had with one of my students. I'm like, how do we do this? We, we got to, and she looked at me and she said, Prof, if you've got a website, you're legit. And I was like. Thanks, Halima. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So with that in mind, um, one of the things in terms of actually inhabiting and, and exploring the, the physical space where health humanities exists in our community, and at UTSC and beyond, one of the things we really uh, directed our energy to doing is building up a kind of virtual presence, producing a kind of virtual presence for health humanities at UTSC. So, that's taken the form of a, of a virtual lab, which I'll take you through in just a moment. But also we have Twitter, we have Storifies, that is these kind of digital storytelling archives of various initiatives that we have done in Health Humanities, for example. Um, a day of a Wikipedia activism where um, my Aging and the Arts class actually went on Wikipedia and edited out all of the really ageist stuff that's across Wikipedia and then added more um, not just age positive, but just age based information where there's very, very little on Wikipedia as it is. So, uh, archiving and illustrating these very initiatives online, creating that virtual presence. And the, the, the kind of home base for all of this is uh, the Health Humanities Learning Lab, which we've called SCOPE. And currently this is a, a, a virtual lab, but my hope, um, if, I can, if I can share my hopes and dreams with you, is that by planting this flag, sort of uh, virtually speaking, that we might one day uh, be able to leverage this kind of uh, the virtual info hub and this virtual group of graduate and undergraduate students um, that we might uh, leverage that into uh, occupying our own material space so that the highly collaborative uh, work that is required of a lot of health humanities work, that can really be done by you know, knocking a few heads together uh, in ways that are always very satisfying for those of us that like doing collaborative research. So here are just some of my graduate researchers. Here are some of uh, just a few of my uh, undergraduates. Uh, people say, oh, it's very rude if you like check your email or check your phone, your lecture. If you want to check out scopelab.ca, go right ahead. I don't mind. Like, you go right ahead. Um, but you'll get a sense of all the, all the people at various stages of, um, of their academic uh, research and activist careers, uh, where they're at um, and what they're doing as part of the Health Humanities Initiative here at UTSC. And by way of summing up, I want to just, again, just very briefly outline for you um, one more uh, initiative, one more piece in this uh, work of emboldening the uh, basis uh, foundation, the data-driven basis for health humanities here in Canada. And that takes the form of a recent study that I just completed. Uh, here's my undergraduate co-author, Marcella Costa. Uh, she just came back from presenting our results in uh, Houston, Texas, just a few weeks ago in March. And what we've just finished doing is writing up um, a qualitative study of student experiences in Canada's first undergraduate health humanities curriculum. And so again, I am going to leap over uh, the details of the study design and so on, but I'm very happy to talk about it in the Q&A. But basically what we did is recruited um, former students in the Health Humanities program, that is those who had taken the Intro to Health Humanities class in either fall 2014 or fall 2015, and we sat them down either in the context of a one-on-one -on -one interview or in a focus group, uh, depending on what their availability was, and we just got them talking about Health Humanities. Here's a list of some of the questions that we asked. You know, what made you decide to take the course? What's the most important thing you learned? What makes it different from other courses? And then this is where things began to get a little bit interesting. You know, how would you convince a friend to take Health Humanities? And what would you say to someone who was reluctant or unsure about this? So we got some very interesting insights there as to how to communicate, not just across disciplines, but how undergraduates might be themselves really important forms of recruitment to um, emergent interdisciplinary uh, projects such as this one.
And then this final question too, what does health humanities make you capable of? And we chose that word capable of very, uh, very specifically. And again, there's so much more I could say, but uh, more or less what we found uh, was very good news. On the one hand, a strongly positive assessment of this kind of approach to health education, but also, and this is really meaningful as well, both incentives and anxieties around getting involved with health humanities. And uh, there are uh, further themes that uh, broke up our data or, or characterized our data, I should say. Um, but again, just like I did for the nursing study, one result that I want to bring your attention to, because I think it really speaks to um, the potential that we have here by uh, enlarging and emboldening uh, health humanities in Canada, is this very unexpected outcome that we, that we found. And that was a theme drawn directly from a quote by a number of students that said, what they got as a result of their health humanities education was a newfound respect for the arts. As you can see here, this is the quotation from a human biology third year here at UTSC, who described it this way. What was the most important thing you learned? The importance of the arts. I feel like that is one of the most important things I learned. Because I feel like art is always pushed away to the side. Like, it's all about the science, it's all about specific fields. I have a newfound respect for the arts through health humanities. Because I've never interacted in this way, right? That was something very valuable. And this is just one example of a, of a similar kind of response that was uh, quite universal across our, uh, our interviewees. So we were very interested to see the ways in which health humanity seems to do something for the arts in addition to doing, say, things that might be relevant to the clinical context or in the service of health professional education. What this study does is begin this work of establishing a kind of a data-driven evidence basis for what it is we're doing here. We're building capacity. We're building capacity in the pre-professional setting that is allowing students to be trained in ways that doesn't necessarily mean they have to go to medical school. They can take this training in health humanities to any number of professions, health-related or otherwise. And one thing that I have to admit I'm extremely excited about is the way that health humanities is a possible strategy for enhancing the rather beleaguered uh, reputation of the arts these days. All you need to do, I'm sure you've done this recently, open Maclean's, open the Star, open the Globe and Mail, and what do we see is that the death of the humanities. Enrollments are plummeting. We see all these things, and I think health humanities is a way of helping those students, helping, and perhaps those parents as well helping maybe folks in general understand that there is a profound value to be had in the arts and health humanities becomes a kind of a gateway to maybe a healthier sense of what the humanities are capable of. So this is where I, I hope over the last uh, hour or so, um, I, uh, I hope I've been able to give you a sense of how the arts and health um, should be understood as having a shared future here in Canada, not only in terms of these applications that I outlined at the beginning, but also for the ways in which health humanities itself might be good news for those of us that uh, value the arts, that are proponents of the arts, and uh, the kind of work and expressions that it does. So three take-home points. I could have started with this, but then you would have left right away. OK? OK. So three take-home points. The first is that arts and humanities-based approaches to health are not just an accessible, but a very engaging way of learning more about the individual texture of uh, health illness and disability. But as a result of current federal funding paradigms, funding landscape, this presents some serious challenges to us concerning how we might actually build up this next generation of health humanities researchers and practitioners. And what this means for us is that anybody that's interested in seeing health humanities grow in the ways that I've suggested, we're going to have to expand our definition of what research involves, what it looks, what it sounds like. It's got to involve advocacy. And even, if I may be so bold, it has to involve activism, especially at the post-secondary level. And so for these very reasons, this is why I consider myself to be very lucky to be researching and educating here at UTSC. And thank you for your time. Happy to answer questions. Thanks. 
um, speaking from your own experiences of, of engaging with this kind of these kinds of dilemmas, these problems, working in the community, um, the fact that you are either a current or former healthcare professionals yourself, or you have loved ones that are, um, I think this this sounds like a really good. <laughs> you sound like the perfect audience for me. Uh, so thanks for for coming. But I would be, as I said, happy to uh, to to answer questions, but also just to sort of see what our connections are as a group um, around these kinds of topics. So I'll, I'll, I'll let somebody else take it away, and you can tell me what to do. Question relative to the individuals who've taken this course and other disciplines, and how that relates to their uh, Question was, um, what is the relationship uh, the students bring um, health humanities back to their home disciplines? And uh, it's, a, it's a really, interesting question and in fact um, in, in, in terms of the student demographic the spectrum if you will um, I have students that are coming from neuroscience from human bio uh, from French from visual arts uh, from English health studies public health uh, there are sort of really is a, you know if we're thinking about disciplines in terms of a spectrum I think there are uh, it's a rather remarkable um, educational setting that has all of these different students these very different disciplinary backgrounds all in one room. One of the things that's precisely one of the um, outcomes that I want my students to be able to articulate at the end of the course, and it's one of the things that I try to speak very uh, frankly about as I'm doing the teaching over the course of the semester, is talking about what a neuroscience student might take away from understanding that fMRI is a form of medical imaging. It is a form of medical illustration. It certainly gives us some data, but the colors are enhanced you know, through uh, the imaging process, um, that that can have uh, very powerful ways of influencing how we think the brain works based on the use of color, based on, and so on and so forth. So one of the questions that I always make sure I include on my course evaluations is, did this course give you, in, I'm paraphrasing somewhat, if course evaluation people are listening or watching or in the audience. <laughs> it goes something like, um, uh, did this course have relevance to your knowledge like outside of, of the specific course itself? I always get really good marks on that. Yes. Um, but, but that is precisely one of the things that uh, I really hope I can kind of hack. And it's important for me to get a sense of exactly who's in the classroom from the very get-go um, for exactly those reasons. Because when I have the opportunity to, I do look for ways to curate or flag material that'll be especially interesting to my human bio students, or especially interesting to my city study students, or especially interesting to um, cohorts that I know are, uh, that are in the classroom. It requires a little more curating on my part, but I think as a result, students feel recognized and they really do feel like, oh, this arts and humanities thing, huh, I'd never thought of the design of cities as aesthetic. I've never thought about universal design. What happens if we were to build a Toronto that was in line, in keeping with principles of universal design, so that an aging population, the so-called gray tsunami, wasn't the, you know, wasn't this goofy, you know, uh, horror house thing that it's made out to be in the popular media, because we're always, we were always planning the city for that to happen. That's one, so that's, for example, one of the ways that I hope that the students can take it home. Because I guess at the end of the day, um, as important and as, 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 as meaningful as preparing students who are interested in medical school, I'm very happy to do that. You know, I've got a position in the Faculty of Medicine. It's important. But that's actually not where my energy is, is primarily directed. I'm really interested in how do we help our, our students who may or may not end up in health professions, how do we help our students think about their own futures, not just as health consumers, but as potential patients, that is, if they haven't been patients already. So preparing ourselves, the condition of being mortal, right? That's one of the things that I hope that this kind of training can, can do, a little more existential, although I, I try to make it uh, as grounded as I can with existential flourishes. Okay. Yeah, Josh. Um, so, part of the work that I do, I, I'm using engagement with the soul care damage, but I'm a graduating arts management student here at UTSC. And so, this, this sort of intersection between health and humanity is very prevalent in my life, especially as someone who has like lived experience with mental illness and uses and has used the arts as a, as a tool to express myself and, and kind of uh, recover or go through a process of recovery. 
Uh, I find that a lot of the work that myself and my coworkers have been doing on the uh, when it comes to youth engagement and using uh, the model of our center, the McCain Center uh, for Child Youth and Family, um, that it really has a lot to do with health humanities in terms of actually utilizing uh, stories and, and just equalizing our creating equal partnership between youth and, and traditional disempowered positions to be on the same level as professionals and have professionals become more empathetic and able to listen. Um, so my, my question is, how do you find, or what, what, I don't know, you may not have the answer, but what would you believe is an effective way of implementing uh, sort of characteristics of health humanities in engagement models in, in hospital or more formal uh, health care institutions? Great question. So if I can summarize a really, really beautiful question in a, in a rather blunt kind of way, um, how can we imagine implementing, and stop me if I'm, if I'm off the mark, but how can we imagine actually implementing these kinds of principles kind of when the rubber hits the road in the clinical or the, 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 health, the healthcare context more generally? Conversation, just, just to loop in, a conversation we were having earlier um, around one of the, the, the many things that's pushing back or uh, complicating the realization of a bunch of really good ideas, right? I don't think anyone can disagree. <laughs> like, hey, if the arts help, you know, I, I don't think there's anything particularly controversial, right, about what I've, what I've been presenting, say, today. Where the pushback does come is, this, is around this question of time, right, and the incredibly time-pressured environment of health, of healthcare, and I would also say certainly of, of medical education as well, right? That that time pressured environment is not just something that begins at the institutional level, it begins in the very uh, medical education and, and really health education model um, that prepares these workers um, to enter the institutional setting. So you're absolutely right to identify that, there, that, that one of the ways that we need to kind of navigate the investment of time it takes to do this kind of work you know, these are not immediately actionable outcomes, right? I mean, sometimes we can sit down, write a journal article or paint a picture or so on and say, you know what, that was really nice. I took that 45 minutes. That was really good. I was really glad I did that. Really glad I watched that TV show or whatever. That's not health humanities, but you know what I mean. Taking that time for oneself. Um, but I think that uh, what you've identified is, 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 you know, that classic kind of area of like the gap between like theory and practice, right? So I was mentioning earlier that in the nursing study I was describing, we had to fight tooth and nail to isolate a constant 90 minute period for those eight nurses, tooth and nail. We paid, uh, we had, um, uh, we, we ensured that we had uh, a nursing, basically the person that was in charge of the nursing timetable, the schedule, she was on our research team because if we hadn't folded her in um, deeply <laughs> and let her know why it was we needed 90 minutes and not just 20 minutes to do this, I don't know, like writing thing, you just read, you write the thing, they leave, right? That's it. No, we need this 90 minutes, we need to steep, we need to have moments of silence, long moments of silence sometimes, listening. Um, really ensuring that she was on board, that was essential to making this happen. And um, we also were sure to compensate our nurses for the time that they took to do this intervention because had we not done that, um, the arrangement that the hospital came up was, with was, all right, well, they can have this 90 minutes, but they're not getting paid for it. Um, so we had to be sure to, to um, compensate the nurses for that time so that doing this kind of work wasn't in essence, you know, punishing them in ways that are really meaningful for them, right? So um, I think one of the one of the ways that um, to enable, just based on my own research, one of the ways we need to kind of enable this kind of work to actually happen and take root in the um, in the particular setting, whether it's in a hospital or so on, is to make sure like all kinds of community engagement, right? Make sure you know what are exactly the, the pressure points, what are, what are the things that are gonna make this fail? And without a very um, deep institutional kind of buy-in that involves folding people in uh, that, that are, that are from, that, from that community or from that kind of institutional setting that are employed there, that work there, that know the ins and outs, that know what doesn't work, that knows that that's not the person that you ask. Without that, that kind of in-person acknowledgement and integration of that into your research model, then this kind of stuff doesn't work. It's not going to. It's just another nice idea and nobody ends up coming because they can't. So my background is primarily in the hospital setting. 
um, I'd be interested to learn more. Maybe there, are, maybe there are other, like, you know, I know there, there will certainly be other specifics when working specifically with a community-based um, approach, but I suspect that those are sort of similar things. You don't have the community buy-in at the ground level, then it's just a very flimsy thing that lasts for six weeks, and um, you can say goodbye to the possibility of doing it again and really instituting a meaningful change. So to that point, is CAMH partnering with this group? And I know you were studying with CAMH. So is there an opportunity for a partnership with uh, CAMH and UT Arts and Humanity? Or is there something happening now? Um, uh, so I'm here at the, uh, as a, in the capacity as a student at UTSC. So I'm, I'm not representing CAMH in any way uh, at, at this uh, at this event currently. It's just purely out of interest and wanting to learn more about health humanities. So I can't speak for CAMH at all. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't want to. Uh, so, so that it, it, it would be very um, important as, as someone who has been both on uh, as a as someone who's been involved with sort of engaging youth or or clients who who have experienced mental health or illness, and as someone who has been a patient on the other side, to see large health organizations take that on and sort of collaborate with academic institutions and sort of these thriving and you know growing uh, programs, you know, such as Health Humanities Minor at UTSC. I think that would be great. I, I, I can't say specifically if CAMH would ever do something like that. So, so to you, you had a partnership Holland Blue Review. Oh, sorry, Holland yeah, Blue so, okay. Thank you. So the, the question would be, uh, relative to that conversation, have you been engaging other institutions? Ah, so uh, currently I haven't, just because um, I'm trying to get tenure and I'm trying to wrap up a few other book projects. <laughs> But that is to say I would love to. Um, no, I, uh, great question. Um, I, I would love to. My list of projects is uh, too long. It is too ambitious. Um, and I'm absolutely excited by all of it. So I'm trying to balance. Um, again, you know, speaking about what are the things we want to do and then what are the things that we kind of have to do. And so that's, that's my own navigation at this point in my, uh, in my career. That said, um, I've had some really uh, very exciting um, uh, discussions with uh, folks from uh, community organizations in the Malvern community. And I think that there is, maybe I won't say more than this, but some, uh, some very exciting possibilities that certainly could be in the works. And one of the reasons um, I'm actually quite attached to, uh, to the lab model, and this is something I think that the humanities can really, really take from the sciences, Take it. <laughs> so it sounds really aggressive, but you know, can borrow from the sciences and, and and really kind of realize to their own ends, is the way in which a group of similarly oriented and really enthusiastic, focused people can begin realizing what the humanities does outside of the small space of a single book or a single project and so on. What happens if we collaborate together? And that's not the typical way we're used to thinking about what we do in the arts and humanities. But I think health humanities and the kind of lab model I'm suggesting here suggests, OK, how can we begin to reach out uh, beyond ourselves, beyond single projects, to involve folks in the community? And all I will say is that those conversations have started. We're using the mic for the camera uh, as well, so. Uh, I'm wondering if, how you feel about the amount of medical information which is available to us as non-medical people, whether that has helped or hindered uh, a more humanistic approach to medicine that you're advocating. Good question. Um, I mean, there are uh, all sorts of, I mean, there are experts in health informatics and um, scholars who focus specifically on the availability of uh, medical or health-related information online um, that could probably give you a, a, a far more developed answer than I'm able to give. That said, um, one of the things that I find quite exciting, we were just mentioning this too, is is the way in which, and again, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if this is uh, a sea change, if this is a result of uh, a kind of a democratization of health knowledge, you know, given, given the, the role of the internet and so on. But the popularity and widespread appeal of um, a book like Being Mortal, 
um, of a book even like uh, Narrative Medicine, the way in which uh, Rita Sharon's Narrative Medicine is really a movement. Um, it has uh, uh, sp spread as, as a, a philosophy of, of medical and health education um, quite thoroughly. And I think that there is, on the one hand, I mentioned, uh, you know, and this won't be a surprise to anybody that spent any time in a hospital recently, there's a sense of dissatisfaction, right, with the status of healthcare. Um, and, you know, whether that, you know, we sort of think anecdotally, I think one of the things that's so powerful about health humanities inspired work is that it speaks to that part of us that, that is anecdotal, that does value story, that this happened to me. And I don't necessarily imagine that my experience is universal to say Canadian healthcare, and yet here's another story that's validating this experience that I had. Um, I think we have to look for ways to navigate this real democratization of health information our love, and I think it's, it may even be sort of a the sort of human nature that's interested in story, that's, that really responds to story, but also how do story and evidence kind of interact with one another, right? You know, if we have a story, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it aligns with health evidence. And so how do we, maybe more critical, so the more critical side of health humanities would be, all right, well, how do we balance this interest in story, this, um, advocacy of the patient voice, this listening to the patient voice, with the, you know, what we know about health and medicine. These are important questions when it comes to matters of profound importance like the rise of vaccine hesitancy in the Western world. Um, what do we do with stories of that nature? Um, so I think that the democratization of, of health knowledge, like most things, has been a boon, but it has also had outcomes that are uh, profoundly concerning. And one of the uh, projects that actually Scope is um, uh, focusing on, one of its project areas, is arts and the public imagination of health. What is the uh, what is the risk, you might say, of 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 a of a more more educated or a more informed um, uh, uh, audience of stakeholders when it comes to to health knowledge? What do we and what do we do with the many 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 kinds of stories that creates? That's just one, one answer to a very good question. Yeah, let me get that over here. And I just wondered why you had picked the pediatric nurses at Dwarview. Ah, okay, so uh, great question. Um, like most research projects I'm discovering, it's serendipity. Um, <laughs> in a sense, um, a couple of my colleagues, uh, Louise Kinross and Shelley Wall, we kind of had cooked up this idea together. And uh, Louise Kinross is, um, uh, has, a, has a wonderful, very important position at Holland Bloor View, where she edits uh, the Bloom newsletter, which is the newsletter that speaks to both the patient and parent, uh, the cl client and family-centered care perspective of the, of the clinical work that's done at Holland Bloor View. Um, we were put in touch by, not quite by accident, but just a mutual friend who said, I think you should all get to know each other. And we did, and the connection that Louise had at Holland Bloorview meant that we could implement this work in that institution. And so there's an example of, I don't want to say it comes down to who you know, but especially, it sort of does. <laughs> okay, great, okay, I don't have to fight you on that. Okay, good. <laughs> Serendipity, that sounds better. Um, but it gives you a sense of also how you, you have to have trust. I think it's very difficult to just sort of fly in either as an academic or as, as an expert of whatever kind, it's very hard to kind of fly into a health setting and have credibility. And so finding ways in the health setting or in the community, as we were hearing from Josh, having ways of speaking to qualifications that go beyond the list of letters that come after your name. What is your, what is your investment in this particular place? No, 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 this particular place. Not this problem, but this place and its people. And I think the, th the, the thicker and more compelling reason you've got there, that's how you begin to build these research relationships. So, I like making friends. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Comment, not question. Um, there is a problem with people leaving health fields for other things. Mm -hmm. 
And you may, this, this kind of just bringing in a change of attitude may help retain people mm -hmm. because they, you might lose some of your best because they get so frustrated. And I, th I can, names come to mind, okay? And they've gone off into something that is more artistic, creative. One into camp leadership, she became a camp, my own sister became a camp administrator and director. She was a nurse, wow. intensive care. They lost her, okay? Um, and someone else who now teaches art, has her own classes, lives locally, and, and, and uh, has her own shows and stuff, she was a nurse. Wow. These are people that could still be excellent nurses. Maybe the, you know, yeah, just a comment. Thanks for that. And, and yes, I mean, it's um, absolutely 100% agree with you. I mean, one of the, uh, as, as I was mentioning during the discussion of the, the nursing study, um, one of the outcomes that narrative training seems to be quite good at addressing is this phenomenon of compassion fatigue, of burnout, and um, something I didn't talk about, but... Uh, Underappreciation. Underappreciation, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, one of the things we could have talked about, too, is, is the fact, that, let's, see how, let, let's be honest about how gender, right, really does intersect, you know, who is a nurse? It's often women. And speaking through the long histories of the mistreatment of the marginalization of female voices, to say nothing of people of color, um, you know, all the ways in which marginalization, the marginaliz marginalization of bodies and voices has worked hard, very hard, to make uh, medical and clinical practices what it is today. Now, I will say in the same breath that there are individuals that are working very hard to try to counteract that very powerful history. And yet, as you say, the inertia of that, of that very ideological and that really exhausting institutional baggage takes the form of burnout, takes the form of compassion fatigue, takes the form of the withdrawal of our very qualified people, takes the form of depression, it takes the form of suicide, which um, suicide rates for healthcare professionals, including doctors, are way above those of the general population. And so this is... Um, this is not just about making pretty pictures and writing little poems, right? I mean, these are the stakes that are involved with an overworked and an overtasked and a multiply overburdened healthcare um, workforce. And this is, I think, a very modest way. Try as we might, you know, we gotta push against a lot of institutional things, but try as we may. If we can have 90 minutes of writing every week and we s s stop one, or enhance the conditions of work for maybe more than that, that to me is worth the pens, the papers, and the 90 minutes it costs to look after our people. Great question, great comment, great comment. No. I'm sorry to hear that that's happened. Oh, hey, they're thriving, were they? Oh, they're fri thriving, excellent, yeah. No, just, <laughs> good for them. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yeah. So that this is a, a little different question. I'm, first of all, I'm really happy to, to see that we may be able to leverage your new program um, to uh, attract some more students to the liberal arts. We've been fighting the good fight for a number of years, um, and it's a losing fight. Yeah. At the moment, I think largely because of lack of understanding of the value, the practical value of the arts, broadly sp speaking. But in this case, um, we get a lot of students at Scarborough who come thinking we're in pre-med. And I know that we have a prominent biologist among us, and biologists in general are not happy with teaching pre-med students, mm. but why not leverage that to begin with? Mm. And um, so for medical school admissions, sure, high grades are important, but roundedness is really important. So I think practically speaking, if we could position this program to say, you wanna go to medical school? This is one of the best ways to do so, um, and get some more. Um, into it, but I'm a little curious. I just checked. Um, it's a B-level course, mm -hmm. um, and it's positioned that way because its prerequisite is four undergrad or four uh, credits. Yeah. So basically, what that means is it's going to be for second years. Yeah. 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 Did you consider making it open to to first year students? Different different kettle of fish. They haven't written an essay yet. <laughs> that was actually one of the major. <laughs> <laughs> One of the major things. <laughs> and also, um, I mean, it's an excellent question. And, and uh, well, you've asked a few questions that I want to make sure we kind of get to. But on this question, like, why, why hold out 
um, and, and sort of make second year the kind of kind of barrier. It is a really good question, and, and I, I, they're, they're both practical, but also some sort of more pedagogical kind of considerations for that. One of the things when this very question was being discussed, what should we make, what, sh what should be the prerequisite? How do we make this open and available, and yet, how do we also create the conditions for student success in a very challenging undergraduate? There's not really any other courses like this. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to, in the way that, there is a certain maturity of second year students um, to maybe give students that kind of first year head first splash into the post-secondary pool, right? Which has all sorts of excitement and uncertainties uh, in, in, its own, in its own right. Just sort of uh, before we kind of throw onto that a very radically interdisciplinary health, <laughs> health class that is sort of unprecedented in this country, we just thought, you know what, let's layer this. <laughs> let's layer this a little bit. So that was part of the pedagogical thinking. Um, but, uh, so, and sorry, your, your first question was, or your first, oh, your first matter was, yes, why don't we leverage this to uh, trick uh, pre-meds into <laughs> taking more humanities? Um, on the one hand, I mean, I, I'm all for that. Yeah, I'm very happy to, in, in whatever ways, um, I mean, even though my, my background is in medical research, you know, my PhD is in English literature, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a humanities folks through and through, right? I also call this stealth humanities. Right, there's health humanities and stealth humanities. So you're sort of like sneaking in words like, you know, texts and representation and this kind of work that we do in the humanities kind of into a health class of stealth humanities. But my, I am cautious about leaning too hard on the, on the appeal for medical school um, for the purpose, for, and there's a few reasons there, um, just to uh, try to imagine how health humanities, and you'll notice that I'm using the language of health humanities, not medical humanities, and there's a reason for that. How health humanities can do things other than um, play to the service of medicine and medical education. Again, not that there's anything wrong with that, and I'm looking directly at people that <laughs> you might be watching that, not that there's anything wrong with that, but can we imagine health humanities as being a little more inclusive than just um, uh, enhancing uh, the clinical objectives of medicine. And I think we absolutely can. And so that would be one of the things that I would be cautious about doing in terms of making this course, if you wanna go to medical school, take this. Certainly I've had a number of students that have gone on to medical school, done their interviews just last week, um, that have done very well. Um, and actually students now that are in medicine and saying that this has been very meaningful work for them to do, really grateful for the class. But um, I'm also really excited to sort of see where this interest, critical creative interest in health can go. Um, there's a lot of energy we put into medical, you know, uh, encouraging students to go to medicine. I'm a little more interested in sort of saying, okay, yeah, medicine, that's great. It's a very noble, very important job. What about other things? There are other health professions. There are other ways of thinking critically about health that can draw on these. So that would be just my, my caution in making this too strong a, a gateway into medicine. But I'm not, I'm not above or below, whatever the right thing is, I'm not above or below um, using that strategy. I'm, I'm all hands on deck, so that's definitely, that's definitely on the list. So we need to get students in the minor mm -hmm. and then create a major and process with this shirt to, to fund the research behind it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Minor, major, shirk. Yeah, you got it. Thank you for that. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Well, perhaps I'll uh, wind things down then. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for your attention and your really thoughtful comments and questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate your time in coming and your time on this. Thank you so much. See, I've switched it to calling you Andrea now because I feel like I've seen inside your head. <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much for coming in for the stimulating discussion. I wanted to let you know that there is a brochure outside that lists all the kinds of events like this that we're having at UTSC. We'd love to see you coming out to more of them as well as the other talks in this series. Um, we have parking passes outside as well if you need one and we also have a little uh, uh, questionnaire on how you found this event because we are taking your input for the future events as well. So thank you again for coming and thank you so much Andrea for your wonderful stimulating conversation.